What's up guys, Tom Fazio here. Welcome to the channel, video, what have you. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not your first time, well, welcome to you too. Uh, some of you guys know that I tend to do a little bit of the martial arts, a little bit of the mind-body, a little bit of the peak performance stuff. I've got a mind-body methodology called weightlessness. It's the bee's knees. Check it out. Just, uh, you know, links in the description and all that. But I'm taking a bit of a tangent from some of the normal content that I produce because uh, I'm uh, releasing a book shortly here uh, that I'm super excited about. And some of the things behind that book, the book is fiction. The thought behind it is not, uh, right? It's, it's, it's largely addressing um, what I would call the uncertainty problem in life. My last book, The Essence of Lightness, was looking at um, essentially the mind and body response to navigating uncertainty in life, which is a super complex problem. I, I break it down probably more than anybody has ever wanted uh, or cared about. Uh, but I think it's an important problem because it helps us inform how to live with intention and how not to get bogged down and destroyed by volatility and uncertainty in life. Important problems, I think. The coming book uh, looks at the externalities of that problem. Lightness looked at the internalities of mind-body. The essence of lightness looks at another question, which is, how do we design good luck? You know, can we create good luck in life with intention? That's a fun problem to solve. Um, yeah, and so that there, there are a series of thought problems and cognitive biases uh, that underlie this book dealing with randomness. And this, I think, is the fourth one and the one that I'm, the one that I'm talking about. Uh, and it's called the prison problem. A lot of these problems that I've discussed are related to one another. And there are certain nuances about each one that make them unique enough to be addressed, right? So somebody that is not carefully thinking about these problems or looking at the, the underlying issues might make the mistake of assuming I'm repeating myself and talking about the same shit, but the nuances in these problems are the problems, and they're super important, they're super deep, and I think that they are why most of us feel stuck and uncertain, uh, and in more severe cases get depressed and dissatisfied and, and complacent and all that kind of shit. So, the prison problem, which I considered calling the options problem, goes something like this. All right, most of us have seen, have seen the Shawshank Redemption or the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, in, in the Shawshank Redemption, you have Andy Dufresne. In the Count of Monte Cristo, you have Edmond Dantes, both of whom are imprisoned for things that they don't do for a very long time. Both of these heroes, they're f fantastic man, movies and great, uh, you know, the, the Count of Monte Cristo is a good book. Um, but they're fantastic hero stories because they deal with extremely isolated plights, right? In a, in a way, I talk about the myth of Sisyphus in one of the other videos. In a way, it's very similar to that, which is having an extremely um, isolated existence, right? In the case of Sisyphus, it's condemned to rolling a boulder up and down a hill. In the case of these two heroes, it's being literally imprisoned in a cell. Uh, and so the prison problem is simple. It's a problem of not having enough options in life to address your, your plight, your happiness, your sense of weightlessness in life. And so for those of you who have been with me a while, you know that I tend to focus on, on mind and body uh, training and development, right? And so in my last book, The Essence of Lightness, I talk about the tools needed to approach this uncertainty, this prison problem from the inside how we reorient, reframe our types of plights and struggles and obstacles, and how we can physically and mentally prepare for hardship so that when volatility hits, it doesn't destroy us. That doesn't necessarily remove the volatility. It doesn't necessarily remove the impact of isolated life existences, right? Like being in prison. Um, but I use the prison example not because hopefully you're not in prison if you are, this speaks directly to you. If you are not, this could be any number of things. You might feel you're imprisoned at work. You might feel like you're in a dead-end job. You might feel imprisoned by not having enough finances to do the things that you want to do, to not you know, date the kind of person you want to date, to not live the kind of lifestyle you want to live. And this is largely the same problem, which is feeling imprisoned. I don't know what to do to overcome my obstacles and feel 
like I'm living with a sense of purpose and power, right? This isn't me. This isn't what I was meant for. I got more in me. And so while part of that equation is the nitty-gritty of mind-body development, you, like you got to do the basics, you got to train, you got to meditate, you got to train, you got to eat right. Part of it too is the software, the software stuff, right? The actual school, the skills and tools and resources needed to overcome your specific plight. And so we had these two characters in the film, in each film. Uh, Andy Dufresne, more so than Edmond Dantes, focused on the externalities, right? He didn't, he didn't particularly develop his mind-body in this scenario. He focused on creating a plan and overcoming his obstacles through mastering the confines of his cell by, by you know, getting in close-knit with the warden, by you know, investing, uh, investing money and acquiring, you know, tools and, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, tools and resources and friends along the way that help him overcome this, this situation. Edmund Nantes does both. So Edmund Nantes, he learns to fence, he builds his body, he learns to focus and meditate and do all this shit so that he's also first priming his mind-body for a different scenario, but he's also mastering the confines of his cell. And so I think there are two lessons here that for me are really meaningful from these two guys. The first, we have to first look at ourselves and ask ourselves, given the current resources and tools and scenarios and circumstances, am I maximizing my effort and my ability to manipulate my current environment to my advantage? And the answer for most of us, for me included, is definitely not. Most of us just think that the solution is a, a kind of a grass is always greener, a kind of if I get that next thing, if I get that next resource, if I had a little bit more money, if I had a little bit better connections, if I had this, everything would be hunky-dory, right? And so I think the challenge that is posed to us by these two awesome characters is, well, May, what if we get those things and we're still not ready because we've never learned to overcome it's a little bit of banging if you guys can hear that uh, construction I apologize uh, it's problem of living in Vietnam um, but if we haven't learned to master our current cell maybe the next set of tools that we would get would be useless to us right it's this idea that if uh, if somebody can't use their fists you shouldn't give them a sword, right? In martial arts, I mean, one of my first instructors would always say that weapons are an extension of the body. You don't need them until you master the foundations. And I think there's something really true about that, that just because you get more money, tools, and resources, and friends doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do any better with it. And I saw, man, I saw this a lot in Shanghai. I worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. And it's amazing how many people will throw money at problems without actually being in the right place to maximize the reach of those dollars spent, the leverage of those dollars spent. It happens all the time maybe because you get the money, you spend the money, this should solve the problem, it doesn't solve the problem. A lot of times um, there's other work that we need to do ahead of time. And so what's great about those two films, those two, two, those two characters, is that we get to see how that can be done, right? Their, their variables are reduced to almost nothing and they look at how, how they can leverage every single tool in their environment to their advantage. That's a great way to start because all of us can do that today. The next topic and the one that I explore in Law of the Die is the idea of increasing options and exposure to options. Because neither character in these books or in these films actually overcame their obstacles or, or went out into life and, and, you know, in the case of uh, the Count of Monte Cristo became the Count of Monte Cristo from... You know, I believe he was uh, a sailor, you know, a poor sailor or something like that, uh, a deckhand or something, before he went into, into prison. But he became the Count of Monte Cristo uh, because he was able to create so many options for himself through focus. And so that's the next stage of the, the equation that, that is explored through Law of the Die, which is that, well... Nobody gets out of prison or escapes from prison in the case of both of these characters, right, who escaped, they weren't released, they both escaped from prison, and then mastered life outside of that. Nobody does that without options. 
And so what I talked about in some of the other videos is that we don't know shit about shit. We can't predict the future. You think that you're going to have a roadmap to success. Great. Execute on that plan. But don't assume that you are smart enough or have the tools and resources to be able to dissect an infinitely complex set of variables and circumstances a la life. And magic is going to happen. For a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that's good in life, good luck, is almost never planned, right? It's circumstantial. And so there's no real way to dominate in that game of life and good luck without a whole lot of options in life that pave the way uh, and grease the grooves of, su of success. And so the question again for me, for you, for all of us that I pose in the book is how do we approach big life problems not by trying to predict the future and create a narrative and a roadmap and just saying this is what I'm going to do for the next five years. I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to learn that next thing. I'm going to acquire these skills. But to say... I don't know. Nobody fucking knows. How do I expose myself to resources, networks, get in front of the right people, expose myself to more highly, highly leveraged types of income streams, um, you know, produce more artifacts or a portfolio of things that I can put out in the world that says this is what I'm about so that people can find me. There's a million ways of looking at the problem. But we cannot just do it with precision, with quality. We need to look at a, quali at a quantitative approach and a volume approach to shit blasting, rolling the dice, setting a lot of options at play because in a lot of ways, if we can't predict the future, we need our friends and our tools and our resources sources working for us and we have to activate those. This is largely a, pro a process of randomness, I argue, I believe. Yeah, and so there's the prison problem for you. On the one hand, master your fists before you get a sword. Master your cell before you start to look at all the other additional tools and resources, but nobody gets out of jail without increasing their options. So, hope that was fun. If you found this uh, interesting at all, guys, please you know comment, like, subscribe all that fun jazz. If you're interested in being a part of the book release and, and in joining, joining this conversation in a deeper way, I do have uh, an appendix to The Law of the Die that is nonfiction that only looks at these thought problems that are, that's a whole lot of fun, I think. You can get it for free from the website, um, weightlessness.co. You'll be queued for that, I think, on the you know first or second section of the website. And yeah, that's about it. So until the next time, be weightless and uh, yeah, roll the die.